Well, good morning. We're back in Ezekiel chapter 14. We're in verse 8, and we're going to read uh, from 14, 8 down to the end of the chapter. We're going to be thinking about deluded prophets. It seems we're on a theme of prophets. We've talked about false prophets, false prophetesses, and now deluded prophets. So beginning in verse 8, it says this, And I will set my face against that man, and will make him a sign and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. They shall bear the punishment of their iniquity, the punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him, that the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, saith the Lord God. The word of the Lord came again to me, saying, Son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch out mine hand upon it, and will break the staff of the bread thereof, and will send famine upon it, and will cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land, and they spoil it, so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beasts. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, they only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. Or if I bring a sword upon that land, say, sword, go through the land, so that I cut off man and beast from it. Though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters, but they only shall be delivered themselves. Or if I send a pestilence into that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man and beast, though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it. As I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, they shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. For thus saith the Lord God, how much more when I send my foresaw judgments upon Jerusalem, the sword, the famine, the noisome beast, and the pestilence, to cut off from it man and beast. Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. Behold, they shall come forth unto you, and ye shall see their way and their doings, and you shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem, even concerning all that I have brought upon it. And they shall comfort you when you see their ways and their doings, and you shall know that I have not done without cause all that I have done in it, saith the Lord God. And again, God will bless that reading from his precious word to us. And as you could see in reading it, there's some difficulties uh, in this passage and some very interesting things to consider. But we're just kind of finishing off, really, the first uh, section, which uh, goes down to verse 8. And uh, we had noticed the um, elders had come last time to uh, hear uh, from Ezekiel. And the Lord uh, saw their hearts and saw that these men had idols in their hearts, and uh, that... Uh, uh, it was a sham that they're coming to uh, ask from God. They'd really no interest or no intention of doing anything with it because their hearts were full of idols. Uh, they were expecting God to speak to them, but they weren't willing to be in a right condition uh, to be spoken to by God. And so as he concludes that little section in verse 8, he comes uh, with this amazing statement. And it's a very uh, serious thing when God says a thing like this, I will set my face against that man. It literally means I'll set myself in opposition against that man. And that is the last thing that any of us would want, to have God actually actively opposing us, setting himself in opposition against us. 
And it says, I'll not only will I set my face against that man, I will make him a sign, he says, and a proverb, and I will cut him off from the midst of my people, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So he's going to make him a sign and a proverb. Now, I want to just to see something here. We've kind of mentioned it as we've gone through Ezekiel, but everything God is doing is he is acting in accordance with the covenant that they voluntarily entered in with him, what we call the Mosaic Covenant. And they they agreed everything that the Lord says we'll do. And he laid out the consequences, what would happen if they didn't do what they said they would do. And so when we look at the, this verse, I want you to go back with me to the book of Deuteronomy. And we're going to look in Deuteronomy and Leviticus, both places where we see uh, concerning this covenantal agreement that they were entered in uh, with with God. And in uh, chapter 28 of Deuteronomy and verse 37, this is what the Lord says, Thou shalt become an astonishment, a proverb, and a byword among all nations, whither the Lord shall lead thee. In other words, if they didn't keep the covenant, God is saying, I'm going to make you a proverb and a byword among the nations, and an astonishment. And so back here in Ezekiel 14, verse 8, and that what he says, I'll set my face against that man, and I will make him a sign and a proverb. And the idea is this, he'll make an example of them. Just as Ezekiel was meant to be a sign, they themselves would be a sign. They would be, they would be an example to others to look at. And so he's going to make them an example, and also they become a talking point. Uh, when people make uh, proverbs or will say something it's proverbial and they they will uh, they will say uh, things about this nation and their waywardness they'd become a, a talking point amongst people around the world look at what has happened to this nation because they turned their back on god and so god is just fulfilling what he said he would do in deuteronomy 28 and so he says, I'm going to do that. Set my face against that man. Make him a sign and a proverb. Cut him off from the midst of my people. Now, let's look at Leviticus and chapter 20. And we'll see about God promising to set his face against them. So we see, again, the same thing that he has promised. He is uh, faithful to do. Uh, if they didn't hold up their part of the covenant, he would do as he said. And so he says in Leviticus 20, verse 3, And I'll set my face against that man, and will cut him off from among his people, because he hath given of his seed unto Moloch to defile my sanctuary and to profane my holy name. Good verse 5. Then I will set my face against that man and against his family, and will cut him off, and all that go whoring after him, to commit whoredom with Moloch from among their people, and the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. And so God had laid it out very clearly. Okay, uh, you want to enter into a covenant with me? Uh, well, here's what's going to happen. You behave yourself, you fulfill the covenant, then you're going to get all these blessings. But if you turn your back on me, you go a whoring from me, uh, then this is what will happen. And so when we look at Ezekiel, uh, we're seeing that all God is doing is being absolutely faithful to the agreement that they entered into freely with him. They said, all the Lord has told you to do, we will do. And of course, he'd laid out the consequences. If you don't do it, this is what's going to happen. And so we're just seeing here God's faithfulness to fulfill his word and to do it exactly like he said. Now we get to a verse that is quite perplexing in verse 9 of Ezekiel 14. It says, And if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet and I will stretch out my hand upon him, will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. And it is a very troubling verse. And a casual reading of the verse would give the impression that it was the Lord's fault that the people were worshiping idols uh, because he had deceived the prophets. And now he's going to judge them for it. And that seems uh, really out of the, what we would consider to be the character of God to do such a thing. But we want to... Uh, kind of dig a little bit deeper here and see that it really is Im an important principle uh, in God's dealings with mankind is being brought before us here. 
because of their continual disobedience, God permitted false prophets to deceive them and prepare them for their doom. And so I want you just to look at an example of this. And again, another perplexing passage, but it's it really, uh, it, again, it, it comes down to this, that um, if God takes men seriously, and if men uh, reject light, then the response of God is to give them the opposite of light. If you don't want light, the alternative is darkness. And how great is that darkness? So look at First Kings with me, please, and chapter 22. And again, we're going to look in at a, a very uh, interesting and yet uh, perplexing little section. Again, uh, in this passage from verse 13, it says, um, uh, And the messenger that was gone to call Micaiah spake unto him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets declare good unto the king with one mouth. Let thy word, I pray thee, be like the word of one of them, and speak that which is good. Now, this prophet Micaiah, um, King Ahab absolutely hated him uh, because uh, his message to Ahab was always bad news. And he, he had got around him a bunch of prophets that were telling him what he wanted to hear. And this fellow Micah would come and tell him what he needed to hear. And he didn't like to hear what Micah said. And so it says, verse 15, so he was 14, and Micah said, As the Lord liveth, that the Lord saith unto me, that will I speak. So he came to the king, and the king said unto Micaiah, Shall we go against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall we forbear? And he answered him, Go and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the king said unto him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou tell me nothing but that which is true in the name of the Lord? And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hill as a sheep that have not a shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house. Peace. So Micaiah says, yeah, you go up against Ramoth Gilead and Israel will be without a king, without a shepherd to look after them because you're going to get killed. You're going to die in this battle, Ahab. And of course, he didn't like that. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me, but evil? And so Micaiah is true to character. He always tells him what he needs to hear, not what he wants to hear. And he said here, verse 19, thou therefore the word of the Lord, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this matter, and another said on this matter, and there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, thou shalt persuade him and prevail also, go forth and do it. Now, therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these, these thy prophets, that the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. So again, wow, this is kind of amazing. Now we've got twice now, we've got it here in Ezekiel 14. We have it in 1 Kings where... God, in his permissive will, allows a lying spirit to enter into the mouth of these prophets. Now, remember, these, these are false prophets. They're not true prophets. Well, we saw earlier that they prophesied out of their own heart. But now, it's not just out of their own heart, but there's actually a demonic spirit that is deceiving, a deceptive spirit that is now uh, being uh, instrumental in speaking through these men. Now, let's just uh, look at some other references, and we'll try and pull this together. Look at Second Timothy. Second Timothy, uh, wonderful uh, book, and and chapter three, and verse thirteen. Second Timothy, <clears throat> chapter three, verse thirteen. It says, "But evil men and seducers." shall wax worse and worse. Now notice this last phrase, deceiving and being 
deceived. So as men become more evil, they open themselves up to more deception and they deceive others as they themselves are being deceived. And so it's quite a, a, a verse piling up this idea that, again, if men reject light, <laughs> then they get darkness and uh, they deceive themselves and they deceive others. And so this is what we find here. Look at Second Thessalonians 2. And then we'll kind of tie it all together. Second Thessalonians 2 in verse 11. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 11. And really, it comes down to this. God takes men seriously. And so we read here. Um, let me just break in. Um, in verse 7. And so it says, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Now, this is in Paul's day. Okay? This mystery of iniquity. Uh, in the days when Paul was still ministering, but it's it's got much worse now. The mystery of iniquity is already working. Only he who now letteth or he who uh, holds back will do it until he be taken out of the way. Speaking of the Holy Spirit in the church, the day is coming when the Spirit of God in the church is going to be removed. And when the Spirit of God in the church is removed, in other words, all that's the rapture when we're all taken out of the way, it says then, verse 8, and then shall that wicked be revealed. That's why no point trying to guess who the man of sin is. He will not be revealed until we're removed. We're holding back uh, the, 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 the global elite's plans uh, for world domination under their man. And we're holding it all back. Then shall the wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. I love that. Every time the, this man of sin is mentioned, immediately after it tells us the Lord's going to destroy him. It says, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Of course, Revelation 19, Jesus coming back with the sword out of his mouth, he's going to slay him and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs of lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So here's people who have been confronted with the truth and they received it not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And so in other words, they said, we don't want your truth. We don't want to be saved. We don't want the gospel message. We don't want what you, the message you're bringing. And when people do that, God is not going to force a man against his will to believe something he doesn't want to believe. God is a perfect gentleman. And so he says, okay, that's the way you want it. If that's the way you want it, you don't want to believe, even though the evidence is overwhelming, you refuse to believe. It says, for this cause, verse 11, every time you see that phrase for this cause, really important phrase, in other words, God is saying, this is the reason for this cause. God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all may be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It was they loved their sin too much. That's why they didn't want to get saved. That's why they didn't want to believe the message. And God says, okay, if that's the way you want it, there are consequences to that. If you reject light, the alternative is darkness. You reject the truth. The alternative to that is a lie. And that's that's what you're going to believe. There's no neutrality. Uh, there's no offense. You either believe the truth or you believe a lie. Uh, and, and so basically, this is what's going on. And so we have to say that this deception is connected with God's permissive will in allowing men what they want. Uh, I want to just read a verse from James chapter 1, just important to throw this into the mix, uh, because it's really important to understand this. Uh, that James 1.13, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. And so God is never the initiator here. M man in his rebellion is saying, I don't want truth, I don't want light, I don't want to hear from God, and God basically says, oh Okay. In fact, in the words of Romans 128, and I think this is exactly what's happening uh, to Judah here in Ezekiel 14, and sadly to our Western civilization, I think this same thing is happening. 
in chapter 1, verse 28, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. This is Romans 1, 28. Notice that they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So they said, okay, we're going we're gonna to look at all the textbooks and we're going to purge them of any reference to God in our history. We're going to sanitize the textbooks. We don't want to retain God in our knowledge. We don't want him taught in the schools. We don't want prayer in schools. We don't want God. We don't want him on the floor of the United Nations. Uh, we just, we want to actually, as it were, purge the world of any reference to God. And so it says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. So God says, okay, is that the way you want it? God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. In other words, God hands them over to what they want. A reprobate mind is a mind that's, that, that cannot make right choices, morally void of judgment. God says, okay, I'm just going to hand you over to that. So the whole point here is that this demonic deception. It's not directly from God. But demonic creatures are eager to act. They're just waiting for his permission. So they're already there, just oh, just chomping at the bit. Or oh, give us a chance to, uh, to, to come in the mouth of these false prophets. Give us a chance. Let, let us have a go. And, and it's only when God gives them over and says, okay, that's the way you want it. I'm going to let you have it just the way you want. And then... These demonic creatures are eager to act. And so um, here's a, a hymn by William Cowper. He, he was a tremendous hymn writer, uh, part of a hymn book called The Olney Hymns. And he was a close friend of John Newton, and they compiled the hymn book together. Of course, we know John Newton and Amazing Grace, but William Cowper was a close friend and neighbor and uh, was, was a prolific hymn writer. And this is what he says. Hear the just law the judgment of the skies, he that hates truth must be the dupe of lies. And he who will be cheated to the last, delusion strong as hell must bind him fast. And so I suppose what we'd say is this. This is really an important message. What we'd say is this. It's important to respond to light. And here's a biblical principle. The more light you respond to, God will give you more light. He loves it when people want light, right? He that uh, hungers and thirsts for righteousness, he shall be filled. Uh, those that want light, God says, I'll give you all the light you want. Those that reject light, God says, okay. If, and again, it's not immediate. Like Judah had 400 years <laughs> uh, of, uh, including good kings. They had the law of the Lord. They had the temple. They had the glory of God. But even with all this light, they said, no, we want darkness. We don't want light. And God says, okay, if that's the way you want it, I'm going to give it to you. And so there are these prophets, and they were speaking out of their own hearts. But now it gets even worse. Verse 9, if that prophet be deceived, whom he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet. In other words, he's allowed, he's given permission, just as we saw in First uh, Kings 22, for lying spirits to do their work. And again, by the way, they can't do anything without divine permission. Do you remember the story of Satan wanting to attack Job? He had to get divine permission before he was allowed to do anything. So even the demonic spirits are subject to him. They can only do what he permits them to do. And so God permits them to act and, of course, there's a consequence. It says, if the prophet be deceived when he hath spoken a thing, I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. But not only is he going to destroy him, notice again verse 10, and they shall bear the punishment of their iniquity for allowing themselves to be used in this way by the powers of darkness, but he says in verse 10, he says, the punishment of the prophet shall be even as the punishment of him that seeketh unto him. So both the inquirer and the false prophet would bear the same judgment. And there are people out there and they don't want truth, but they, wanna, they want to hear messages from the powers of darkness. They, they, they love 
false teaching. They love to be told what they want to hear. In other words, what man wants, and we've said this a lot, really, man wants um, wants divine involvement or, or spiritual involvement in his life as long as he doesn't have to change from his wicked ways. And so it's interesting that in the last days, when the great deception occurs, it'll be quite religious. It'll include beast worship. And they'll gladly worship the beast. Uh, when Christ came, uh, they rejected him, but another will come in his own name. Him they will receive. And the reason why they'll receive him is he makes no moral demands on them. They continue in their sin and they can continue in their perversions and still have this spirituality without repentance and without living a moral, holy life. And that's why there's an appeal. That's why it's so appealing. And so both the inquirer, because they want to hear a message that tells them they can continue in their sin and no repentance is needed. And also the false prophet who has given himself over and opened himself up to the demonic realm uh, to be used of them. Both of them will face divine judgment. <clears throat> By giving the people lying prophets who proclaim to the people exactly what they want to hear, Jehovah ensures the people's judgment. In other words, he's allowing them to fit themselves to judgment because of their willful choices. Verse 11, it says that the house of Israel may go no more astray from me, neither be polluted any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God, saith the Lord. So there's a, there's a divine reason behind all this the fiery judgment god is going to consume the sinner but he's also going to cleanse the nation at the same time and so he's preparing the way uh, so that the, the the this example of his divine judgment on the false prophet and those that are eager to hear him and all of this judgment that's going to come it says that the house of israel may go no more astray from me neither be polluted anymore with all their transgressions, but they might be my people and I be their God, saith the Lord. So he's kind of using it to purge them so that they'll come back to him and have a right relationship with him. And again, a, rela a relationship that is not allowing them to go astray anymore and also and not polluted with their abominations. So I want you to look at Isaiah 4, verse 4. Uh, we see again this idea of God purging and cleansing so that he might have a proper relationship with them. Isaiah 4 and verse 4, it says, When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And so the idea is this, God is... is in the business of purging and cleansing all this filth away so that he might have a right relationship with his people. God is determined to use the wickedness of his people, in this case, both people and prophet, to affect their cleansing from pollution. That's what God intends to do. So now we move into a, an even another interesting section of Ezekiel, and from verse 12 of chapter 14 to the end of the chapter. And this is... Uh, the futility in expecting God to save them while they persist in their iniquity. It's what we would say is inescapable judgment. And no hope was to be found in the godliness of others. So they answer kind of another objection to those who say that God will not be as ruthless in his judgment as prophets like Jeremiah and Ezekiel were saying, because he, he can't afford to ignore the righteousness of some of his godly people. And so the idea is this, that because there are some godly people, and there have been some godly people amongst God's people, then he, then he can't judge them because he won't judge them because of those that are there. Um, maybe some of them remembered how their father Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah. Do you remember that back in Genesis 18? And, and, and he's appealing to the Lord. He says, if, if I can just find you know, kind of 
uh, a few righteous in the land would you would you would you destroy the land when there's a few righteous people there and so they started this bargaining process and and of course uh, it got down to 10 and uh, of course sadly they weren't even 10 righteous <laughs> and so Sodom perished uh, but I guess their thinking is that maybe there's somebody like Abraham, some righteous person in the land that is still praying. And even though we don't want to change, maybe God won't judge Jerusalem and won't judge Judah while ever there's some of these intercessors still around, still praying. And so they, that was their hope that uh, we, we want to continue in our sin, but maybe there's a few godly people here and they're staving off the inevitable judgment. Now, I want to look at some interesting verses because um, what's fascinating about this passage is that there comes a point of no return where even the intercession of the most righteous men will not avail. In other words, it, 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 there comes a point, and, and only God knows this, where a nation have gone beyond the point of no return. And certainly what we're going to see here, this is where they're at. They are so entrenched in their evil and their wickedness. They're so unrepentant, unbroken, and, and that the only thing left after lots of encouragements from the prophets rising up early, encouraging them to repent, they've got to the point where they just they can't turn back. They're just so set in their wicked ways uh, that God says that even if the most righteous men would intercede, it's too late. So let's just look at some of these scriptures that I want to bring before us. They're very interesting to me. And, and they're in the book of Jeremiah. Remember, this is a parallel. He's speaking uh, to the people that are still in Jerusalem, whereas Ezekiel is ministering to those who are already in captivity. But it's the same time frame. They're both speaking at the same time. And their message has a lot of parallels. And so we'll see in Jeremiah 7 and verse 16, this is God's instructions to his prophet. He says, therefore, pray not thou for this people, neither lift up cry nor prayer for them, neither make intercession to me, for I will not hear thee. Wow, isn't that something? God is telling his prophet, don't pray for these people. I'm not going to listen. <laughs> they're so far gone. They're so bad that you're just wasting your breath, Jeremiah, to even pray for them. Jeremiah 11, verse 14. And again, this is the weeping prophet. I'm sure that he prayed passionately. Uh, you know, his heart is very tender. And yet God says, don't even bother, Jeremiah. I don't want to hear. Uh, chapter 11, verse 14. Therefore, pray not thou for this people. This is eleven fourteen. Neither lift up a cry or prayer for them, for I will not hear them in the time that they cry unto me for their trouble. Again, I'm not going to listen. Chapter 14, verse 11. Then said the Lord unto me, pray not for this people for their good. It's too late. Judgment is certain. Don't, don't waste your breath. Don't do it. Chapter 15. We're going to add to our list of heavy hitters in, in Ezekiel. We've got Noah praying and Daniel and Job. And we're going to add to that list in chapter 15 of Jeremiah. Then said the Lord unto me, though Moses and Samuel stood before me, yet my mind could not be toward this people. Cast them out of my sight, let them go forth. And it shall come to pass, if they say unto thee, whither shall we go forth, then thou shalt tell them, thus saith the Lord, such as are for death to death, such are for the sword to the sword, such are for the famine to the famine, such are for the captivity to the captivity. So now we've got this incredible list of holy men of God, Noah, Daniel, Job, Moses, and Samuel. Imagine a prayer meeting with these five men. <laughs> you'd think, surely God's going to hear that. And yet God is telling us, even if they prayed, it's too late. I'm not going to listen. So very interesting. In other words, they're, they're ripe for judgment. They've gone past the point of no return. 
Now, again, we don't know that. The Lord is not telling us to stop interceding for our nation, just in case anybody draws the wrong deduction, right? We need Noah, Daniel, Job type characters to intercede for our wicked generation because the Lord has not instructed us, don't pray for them. It's too late. He hasn't told us that yet. So, in fact, while ever the church is still here, there's still opportunity, still a day of grace. And so we should be praying. Uh, again, First Timothy, uh, first of all, prayers, intercessions, giving of thanks be made for all men, right? And, and especially that they might be saved. God would have all men to be saved. So we're not quite in this day right now that we're looking at in Ezekiel 14. And it's okay to pray for those that won't pray for themselves. It's okay to pray that God would, would work and bring an awakening in our land and save these lost sinners. And so don't stop right now. Uh, but there comes a point where it's too late. So verse 12, the word of the Lord came again to me saying, see back in Ezekiel 14, son of man, when the land sinneth against me by trespassing grievously, then will I stretch mine hand upon it and will break the staff of the bread thereof and will send famine upon it and will cut off man and beast from it. So again, just a reminder basically here that we're, we're still looking at this old covenant that God had entered in with the nation of Israel and God is going to fulfill the promises. So I want you to go with me and you, you can keep your finger in Leviticus 26 uh, or put a ribbon in there because we're going to be flipping back and forth here a little bit when we look at verse 13 verse 15 verse 17 and verse 19 all of them refer back to this chapter god's four weapons that he is going to bring against uh, this covenant breaking people and so we notice uh, he's going to break the staff of bread leviticus 26 verse 26 and when i have broken the staff of your bread ten women shall bake your bread in one oven and they shall deliver you your bread again by weight and you shall eat and not be satisfied so god promised them again this is if they were disobedient to the covenant that they had freely entered into with god all that god says to us we will do they have not done it and so here are the consequences that God spelled out before them. And one of them is, I'm going to break the staff of bread. And so it's famine, Leviticus 26 and verse 6. Maybe we'll look through these four weapons before we get into Noah, Daniel, and Job. Look at verse 15 of Ezekiel 15, uh, 14, should I say? Ezekiel 14, verse 15. If I cause noisome beasts to pass through the land. And they spoil it so that it be desolate, that no man may pass through because of the beasts. Again, you kept the ribbon in Leviticus 26 and verse 22. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children and destroy your cattle and make you few in number and your highway shall be desolate. So again, this is the covenant agreement. He's laid it out for them. And now they're actually experiencing god fulfilling his covenant verse 17 or if i bring a sword upon that land and say sword go through the land so that i cut off man and beast from it again verse 25 of leviticus 26 it says and i will bring a sword upon you that shall avenge the quarrel of my covenant when you are gathered together within your cities i will send a pestilence among you and you shall be delivered unto the hand of the enemy Notice as well as the sword, he mentions the pestilence. And that brings us nicely to verse 19, where we read, he says, or if I send a pestilence onto that land and pour out my fury upon it in blood to cut off from it man or beast. So I think it's clear here, uh, and it's really help, helpful to us have this background understanding. They themselves entered into this agreement. They understood the terms of the covenant. God laid it out. If you obey me, I'm going to bless you in all these incredible ways. If you rebel against me and go after your whoredoms and your idolatry and all the rest of it, then this is the consequences. And now they're actually happening. So we get to verse 14. He says in 1414 of Ezekiel, though these three men 
Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it. They should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, saith the Lord God. Now, this language will shatter this false hope that they had that maybe God would not judge Judah because there might be a few godly people praying. And God says, okay, let's assemble the kind of list of heavy hitter godly people that I can think of. By the way, isn't that amazing that Noah, Daniel, and Job, as, as far as God's inspired estimation, these are men that he would listen to because they were righteous men. So if Noah, Daniel, and Job were presently in Jerusalem, they would deliver their own souls only. So it teaches us that the prayers of the greatest intercessors cannot avail if men persist in their unbelief and rebellion. Greatest intercessors that we could imagine. Now, what's amazing about this list is that Daniel is actually alive and in Babylon in exile right now in Ezekiel's day. And so that tells us what a reputation for godliness he must have had that Ezekiel and those in the captivity talk about Daniel. In fact, uh, he's mentioned one of the time, if you look at Daniel, uh, at Ezekiel 28, Ezekiel chapter 28 and verse 3, he says, Behold, thou art wiser than Daniel. There's no secret that they can hide from thee. So, so here's Daniel, and he has this incredible reputation in his own day for being a man of great wisdom and great moral integrity. And oh, wouldn't that be wonderful if, if we had such a reputation in our day for that kind of thing? Or we often sing, dare to be a Daniel. We need some Daniels in our day. Men of the highest integrity and men of the greatest wisdom and men who would intercede and would be people of prayer. So why does the Lord mention these three men in Scripture in this context here? Well, first of all, they're all identified as righteous by the Old Testament Scriptures. They all have this reputation for righteousness. So let's just look at that. Uh, we know it anyway, but it's good to remind ourselves. Genesis 6 and verse 9. In a, in a, again, and I, I find Noah probably one of, my, uh, one of my greatest heroes in a sense that um, he had so little fellowship and so little encouragement, and yet he walked with God. You know, the world was... Well, the Lord says it's going to be like that when, before he comes, as it was in the days of Noah. It's going to be just like those days. But they were wicked days. And yet, we could always make excuses, you see. We could say, well, you know, if only I was living back then, it would be a lot easier back in that day. But, but we're living in a difficult time. Sure we are, but it's not as difficult as Noah's day. And yet it says, uh, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and noah walked with god the idea of perfect is the idea of upright mature in all his generations uh, the book of job again noah daniel and job and we'll we'll look at job here for a moment job chapter one verse one now this is from the very mouth of god there was a man in the land of us whose name was job and the man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil or avoided evil. Chapter 2 of Job, verses 2 and 3. And the Lord said to Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil, and still he holdeth fast his integrity, although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. So again, this is God. It's almost like he's saying, let me let me show you my, my servant Job. Here's a man who's a godly man. Coming from the mouth of God, that's, that's some 
uh, compliment, isn't it? Uh, have you considered my servant Job? And then, of course, the next book after Ezekiel is Daniel. And we've got a couple of times Daniel is mentioned in that way. Daniel 6, verses 4 and 5. It says, Then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they could find none occasion, nor fault, nor as much as he was faithful, neither was there any error or fault found him, in him. Then said these men, We shall not find any occasion against this Daniel, except we find it against him concerning the law of his God. And isn't that amazing? Here are enemies who are looking to find something, some chink in the armor of Daniel. And as hard as they search, they said, the only way we're going to get him is concerning the law of his God. Wow, what a, what a testimony this man had. At 6 and verse 22, it says, My God has sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouths, that they have no hurt, not hurt me, for as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. And so uh, they were; these men were all identified as righteous. They were all tested and proved faithful. Noah was tested in his generation by the ensuing flood, Daniel by the lion's den, and Job in trials with Satan. All were men of faith. Noah's faith helped save his family and preserve creation, Hebrews 11, 7. Daniel's faith uh, saved his own life and the lives of his friends uh, when he uh, believed that God would give him an answer uh, concerning Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2, 24. And Job's faith, well, maybe we'll just take a minute to look at this one because this is one of my favorite verses, Job 42 the book of Job and chapter 42 and verse 7 and 8. It says, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for you have not spoken of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. hath. Therefore, take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly in that you have not spoken of me, the thing which is right like my servant Job. And verse 10, the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. So again, he saved them from divine wrath. And of course, we could say about uh, Samuel and Moses, who Jeremiah mentioned, both of them were intercessors several times when God was going to destroy the nation of Israel. And Moses interceded, Exodus 32, Numbers 14. Uh, Samuel, uh, he prayed for the nation of Israel. In fact, he, he says that, uh, uh, if it, save me from sinning against God if I cease to pray for you. So these men were, were all men of faith, and they were men who were known for intercession and prayer. And yet, he says, even if these men were present in Jerusalem, all five of them, and they were having a prayer meeting, he said, it's too late. They would save their own souls, their own lives, by their righteousness. But it's too late for the city of destruction. God is going to destroy it. And so we can infer, by the way, from this, because our German higher critics don't think that this Daniel was the Daniel living at this time, but some other character. And they also don't believe that Job was a real person who really existed. And again, we just say the Sadducees, they are sad, you see, because they just do not believe in the supernatural. And we believe with all our hearts in the, the inerrancy of the scriptures, and that this Daniel is the Daniel that's mentioned in the book of Daniel. And this man, Job, was a real person who really lived, and maybe a, uh, a contemporary with Abraham, and uh, lived uh, as a great testimony in dark times. And so, 
verse 15, it says, if I cause nice and beasts. Now, again, he talks about uh, these, these four score judgments that he's mentioned, and he talks about the beasts. And um, it is interesting that um, um, when uh, a population um, begins to decrease, uh, the wild animals tend to come back into that area. And uh, those stragglers that are left can often become the victims of the attacks of these animals. And so um, interesting that if you look back in Deuteronomy, that when God drove out the Canaanites, he didn't do it all at once. And there was a reason that the people would be spread too thin and the wild beasts could attack them. So, for instance, chapter 7, verse 22 of Deuteronomy, he says, The Lord thy God will put out those nations before thee by little and little, that thou mayest not consume but at once, lest the beasts of the field increase upon thee. And so the thought is this, that if, if they had have driven them all out immediately, there weren't enough Israelites uh, to kind of, they'd be sparsely populated and they would fall prey to the creatures, the the wild beasts. And of course, Israel knew something of that, didn't they? Numbers 21, do you remember when they're in the wilderness and God sent the uh, the serpents to bite them in the wilderness? Um, uh, so there's, there's lots of examples in the scriptures of God using the beasts uh, to attack uh, uh, people and uh, as part of his weaponry and his... Um, his armory to judge people. Second Kings chapter two and verse 24. It says, and he turned back and looked on them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. And there came forth two she bears out of the wood and tear 40 and two children of them. Two Kings 17. Just occasions when the wild beasts wrought devastation amongst the people. Uh, verse 25, it says, So it was at the beginning of their dwelling there that they feared not the Lord. Therefore the Lord sent lions among them, which slew some of them. Uh, wherefore they spoke of the king of Assyria, saying, The nations which thou hast removed and placed in the cities of Samaria know not the manner of the God of the land. Therefore he hath sent lions among them. And behold, they slay them, because they know not the manner of the God of the land. And so that's part of the divine judgment. And of course, uh, one of the things that prophecy watchers will tell you is that uh, the increasing number of these kind of attacks in our culture today, people attacked by alligators in Florida, wolves in you know various places, and how many people's pet pooches turn upon them and savage them. Uh, that's happening too, isn't it? And so, uh, again, uh, evidence of divine judgment. It says, verse 16, though these three men were in it, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither sons nor daughters. They only shall be delivered, but the land shall be desolate. You see, in a sense, we can't rely on the prayers of somebody else. We personally are responsible before God for our own actions. And what we need to do is we need to take serious our own personal piety and relationship with the Lord and not depend on someone else to get us in. And it's interesting how sometimes people do that. They'll uh, unsave people uh, will say, well, I've got such and such praying for me or whatever, as if they're going to uh, help them in the day of judgment. In the day of judgment, everybody has to give an account for his own sins. And so we cannot depend on these others. Well, our time has gone, and we're not quite out of chapter um, 14. I don't know what we're going to do when we get to chapter 16 because it's the longest chapter in Ezekiel. It'll probably take us several ones to get through that. But anyway, may the Lord encourage us with this chapter. Amen.